Hello, everyone. I am very happy to be here again for the MSK case presentation series after this short break in July. On behalf of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro and OCAD, I want to welcome and thank everyone for tuning in today. My name is Aline Serfari, and I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Berangameni, who will moderate this session with me, as well as our guest speakers, Dr. Julio Brandão, Dr. Heba Almutairi, Dr. Beth Petil, and Dr. Sabrina Veras. The presentations today will be recorded and available on demand on the OCAD website, uh, which is ocadmsk.com and on the YouTube channel of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro. For those of you who are unfamiliar with OCAD, it is a knowledge sharing forum where members post challenging cases uh, on a daily basis and count on each other to solve these difficult cases. To have access to this MSK content, please consider registering on the OCAD website. Uh, the speakers today will present their cases and at the end, we will have a Q&A session. If you have questions at any time during their presentations, please put them in the chat box. And at the end, the speakers will respond to them. Just a reminder, um, attendees have not been given the permission to screen record any of these presentations as they may contain material under copyright. An authorized recording use distribution and sale of this material without permission from the speaker is illegal. We thank you for your understanding and without further ado, I will kick off the session. Um, Birang, please introduce, could you please introduce our first speaker today? I think you're mu muted. Thank you, I just muted and muted. <laughs> It is my pleasure today to introduce um, Dr. Beth Vettiel. She is an ABR certified MSK radiologist. She did her residency training at University of South Alabama and her fellowship with us at, M uh, at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Musculoskeletal Imaging. She is currently working in rural Virginia, having served as chair of radiology at Central Southside Community Hospital. Her research interests include musculoskeletal cancer imaging and radiology education, and I'm happy to um, introduce her. Beth, it's all you. Thank you for introducing me. Um, so I have a case. Um, can y'all see my screen? Yes. Not yet. Oh, no, we can't see your screen. I can see you, but not your screen. Yeah, now I can see your screen. Okay. Great. Yes. Yeah, so my name is Beth Vettiel. I have a case of a 66-year-old uh, lady who comes in with right hip pain. So her initial X-rays show that she has bilateral hip arthroplasties. We get an MR after one month, and these are some axial stir images. You can see how uh, there is a lesion surrounding um, her right hip, which is hyper intense on stir imaging. And there are some low level um, debris uh, within the lesion. These are some T1 coronal images taken at the same time. You can see that the lesion is hypo intense on T1. These are post contrast images taken at the same time. You can see how uh, there is no internal enhancement within the lesion. This lesion was aspirated under ultrasound. We can see how the lesion itself is hypoechoic on the ultrasound and there is no color Doppler flow. The pathology results um, showed no malignant cells, just abundant mixed inflammation. So these, um, a lot of terminology is thrown around uh, trying to describe um, these kind of reactions. You have adverse local tissue reaction, you have ALVAL, which is aseptic lymphocyte dominated vasculitis associated lesion. You have pseudotumor, metallosis, traniosis, synovitis, um, polyethylene associated synovitis. So a lot of terms are thrown around. Um, 
And let's look at the basic components of a hip implant. You have um, the femoral component, and then you have the establer component. The establer component has the shell and a liner, and the femoral component has a head, a trunnion, which is the connecting portion, and then the stem, which is itself is the part that goes into the femur. There are five kinds of um, FDA approved hip implants. You have the Metlon Metal, the Metlon Polyethylene, the Ceramic on Polyethylene, the Ceramic on Metal, and then you have Ceramic on Ceramic. So the adverse effects from um, these implants can be classified into um, two kinds based on etiology. You have uh, adverse effects that are resulting from metal ions. Um, this can be systemic or local. The systemic effects can result in neurotoxicity, in thyroid toxicity, or cardiac toxicity. The local effects from metal can involve ALBAL, which is the aseptic lymphocyte dominated vasculitis associated lesion. You can also have metallosis or particle disease. And the polyethylene um, associated adverse effect is usually local. This can result in um, particle disease or polyethylene associated synovitis. So let's look at the differences between um, these four kinds of uh, entities. So you have the ALVAL, which is caused um, by the metal ion. It usually results in synovial thickening, which we can see on imaging, and it may also result in capsular dehiscence, again, which can be seen on imaging. This kind of um, hypersensitivity is type 4 mediated, which is lymphocyte mediated. Then you can have metallosis, which is caused by larger metallic debris. The metal itself would be visible on the um, MRI um, showing the low signal. And you can also have low signal osteolysis. Uh, this is usually mediated by a histiocytic reaction. Then you have the particle disease, which, is, which can be caused by metal ions, polyethylene particles, or even the cement that is used. This can result in osteolysis or cystic changes in the bone. And this is mediated by a giant cell reaction. The fourth kind is the polyethylene associated synovitis, which is uh, caused by polyethylene. This is also caused by a giant cell reaction. And the main imaging finding is this frond-like hypertrophied synovium. This is an example of an ALBAL, which is caused by the metal ion. Um, it has a loculated abscess-like appearance. And it also may result in synovial thickening and capsule dehiscence. On um, h &E preparation on PATH, you can see how there is a blood vessel and all these lymphocytes are clustered around the blood vessel. So it's a lymphocyte-mediated vasculitis associated lesion. Now we have metallosis. You can see the low signal areas on the MRI, which are from the actual piece of metal being in there, tiny particles of metal being in there. Um, on the h &E preparation, you can see the metallic debris which have been phagocytosed by the histiocytes. Um, now we have particle disease, which can be caused by polyethylene, metal ions, or even cement. This shows the lytic appearance um, of the bone. And on uh, h &E's preparation, you can see how there is a giant cell. Giant cells are huge cells with multiple nuclei in a single cell. And these are phagocytosing um, the metal particles. And here you have metallic uh, particles within the connective tissue. The fourth kind is the polyethylene associated synovitis. Um, this is an MRI, MR image, which shows the frond-like um, fragile looking hypertrophied um, synovium. And on the h &E preparation, you can see how there are, um, again, giant cells, but here they are phagocytosing um, the P flakes, the polyethylene flakes. Other confusing terms that I have come across are um, adverse local tissue reaction, which is kind of an umbrella term to describe any kind of local tissue reaction. Then you have the pseudotumor, which is any local tissue reaction, which also has a mass effect like um, ALTR or metallosis or um, ALVAL. The another term that I have come across is trunnionosis, which is just where of the um, trunnion or the part which connects the femoral head uh, portion of the uh, arthroplasty to the femoral um, stem portion. 
the treatment options in these cases usually involve either monitoring, which you can monitor by using MRI or monitor the iron levels. Uh, the definite treatment is usually revision of the implant. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beth. Love the images, love the pathologic correlations. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, now it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and the great radiologist from Rio de Janeiro, um, Dr. Sabrina Veras. Uh, she graduated from the Federal University of POE with a medical residency in radiology and a fellowship in musculoskeletal imaging at Santa Casa de São Paulo. And a second fellowship in MSK image at the Bogis Salenco Hospital in Lille, France. Uh, she's a practicing radiologist at the IRM and Philippe Matoso Lapis, acting as one of the fellows professors. Dr. Sabrina Veras is co-author of book chapters and MSK um, radiology papers. Since 2019, she has been one of the active participants of the MSK Image Group of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and since 2013, she has coordinating, uh, coordinated the monthly MSK uh, imaging meeting of the Rio de Janeiro's Orthopedic Society. And with that, please, Sabrina, share your screen. Okay. Just a minute. Am I sharing? Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yeah. 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 Hi. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I would like to thank the organizing committee, especially Dr. Aline Sefari. So let's talk about my case. My clinical case is about a 79-year-old female. She was involved in a car accident one week prior to the doctor appointment. Since then, she has been reporting upper back pain. On physical examination, the neurologist found signs of spinal cord syndrome with urinary and fecal incontinence, mercadispastic perperases with progressive worsening, and sensory level below T5 sensory dermatome. So she came to our clinic to undergo an MRI, and these are the findings. Here we have the sagittal images, and we can see extensive mass occupying the epidural space from T5 until T11 displacing the spinal cord. We can see that the lesion presents isosignal on T1 weighted images, slightly hypersignal on T2 and hypersignal on stir weighted images. We can note also a small fracture in the inferior end plates of the T T12 vertebra with adjacent bone marrow edema here. Here we have sagittal, T1 with fat saturation before and after the gadolinium. And we can note that the lesion presents a diffuse and homogeneous enhancement to gadolinium. And we can conclude that it's not a post-traumatic hematoma, but a mess. Here we can see more magnified images and we can note that the lesion extends posteriorly involving the posterior elements of T8 vertebra with hyposignal on T1 weighted images, hypersignal on stir, more evident, and also a prominent and diffuse enhancement to gadolinium. We can note also enhancement of adjacent soft tissues here in this level. Here we have sagittal and axial T2 weighted images. Please note how the lesion displaces and compresses the spinal cord here, here, and especially in this level. And we can note also that spinal cord presents hypersignal on T2-weighted images. That means a compressive myelopathy. 
Please note how the lesion extends posteriorly at the T8 vertebral level and compromise the posterior elements here and here, and also the paraspinal muscles in adjacent soft tissues here. We can compare this level abnormal with this level just below the lesion with a normal aspect here. Here we have sagittal and axial, T1 with fat saturation after the gadolinium. And we can note the diffuse and homogeneous enhancement of the epidural lesion here and here. And we can also uh, can note also the enhancement of the posterior elements of the T8 vertebra with also enhancement of the perispinal muscles and adjacent soft tissues. So she was transferred to the hospital and was submitted to a surgery to decompress the spinal cord. And the histopathologic examination was compatible with plasmocytoma, infiltrating bone, fibroadipose, and muscle tissues. The pathology suggested us to, co to correlate with clinical and radiological finds to consider multiple myeloma. So after the surgery, she was to underwent a PET CT, and these images were kindly considered by Dr. Dominic. On PET CT, we can note poor surgical alterations with laminectomy from T5 until T11, the same level of the epidural lesion that we have seen at MRI. We can see again the small fracturing on the inferior plate of the T12 vertebra, as we have seen at MRI. And we can note an increase in FDG metabolism of the bone marrow, more evident in toracolumbar spine and the pelvis, here and here, but without corresponding morphological change. So she didn't have osteolytic lesions. And the SPET-CT was not as specific to conclude as multiple myeloma. And it was suggested to correlate with laboratorial findings. After that, we have the laboratory examinations results. She had no other features for CRAB. She had no hypercalcemia, no renal impairment, no anemia, and no morbid lesions. She had Benz Jones proteins in urine. Her kappa lambda ratio was 300, and the bone marrow biopsy showed plasmocytosis 15%. With these findings, we can conclude as multiple myeloma with extramedullary presentation. So let's talk about multiple myeloma. It is a clonal plasma cell proliferative disorder characterized by primary infiltration of bone marrow and excessive production of abnormal immunoglobulin. It is the second most common hematologic malignancy after the lymphoma, and it is the most common primary bone malignancy and occurs between 40 to 80 years old. It represents 1% of all cancers and is likely more than 10% of hematologic malignancies in the United States. Bone disease is, the, is one of the most prominent features of multiple myeloma, and imaging has an important role in diagnosis and follow-up. Here we have one table showing the diagnostic criteria for multiple myeloma, defined by the International Myeloma Working Group. Please note in red the features that we could see in our patient. She had clon clonal bone marrow plasma cell more than 10%, it was 15%. She had biopsy proving extramedullary plasmocytoma, and she had involved and involved serum free like 10, Rachel more than 100, she has 300. Let's talk about extramedullary myeloma. There are several controversies surrounding the precise definition of extramedullary myeloma. It is an unusual presentation of multiple myeloma. A little is known about its incidence in natural history. It is seen in 7 to 18% of newly diagnosed myeloma and in 6 to 20% during the disease course. 
Extramedullary myeloma may be found at the time of multiple myeloma diagnosis, called primary EM, or at the time of myeloma relapse, called secondary EM. It has poor prognosis due to decreased overall survival. Extramedullary myeloma can also be divided into two more groups. The first one is called soft tissue related disease, resulting from plasma cell infiltration into soft tissues with no relationship to the bone, like we can see in these black arrowheads here and here. And it, it can also be called bone-related disease, extending directly from osteolytic bone lesions, also known as paramedullary myeloma, like we can see in these blue arrows here, and especially here, the same we have seen in our case. There are no established guidelines for the imaging workup for patients with suspected extramedullary myeloma. MRI is a highly sensitive method for EM diagnosis, especially for this high resolution of soft tissues and CNS structures. PET-CT permits not only an anatomical, but also functional imaging, enabling assessment of focal activity of EM. Moreover, it's frequently necessary to perform biopsy and it's necessary to distinguish between EM tumors and second primary tumors that may occur in multiple myeloma patients. Here we have one table showing the distribution of extramedullary myeloma. When we, we talk about lesion contiguous with the bone, the most common presentation is as epidural and perispinal mass, similar to our case. And the most common location was at thoracic spine. Here we have one example from this article, and we see extramedullary myeloma presenting as a perispinal, sorry, epidural mass, similar to the case I'm presenting here. Here is another example from another article, very similar to the case I'm presenting also. When we talk about differential diagnosis of epidural lesions, we have to think about all these lesions lymphoma, metastasis, epidural abscess, amyloidoma, meningioma, neurinoma, vascular mass, hematoma, and angiolipoma. The, here we can see one example of epidural lymphoma, very similar to our case. Here, another example, an epidural metastasis from gastric cancer. And here, an epidural hematoma. So as key points about extramedullary myeloma, it is an unusual entity that has non-specific image features at MRI and should be included in the differential diagnosis of epidural mass lesions. Knowledge of it, its image features may help radi radiologists to suspect it. Contiguous extramedullary myeloma most commonly occurs as a mass in the perispinal and epidural locations, like the case I'm presenting. And the overall prognosis in terms of survival is poor, but early decompression can prevent neurological deterioration and improve quality of life. I'd like to thank my, my dear colleagues, Eduardo Brown, Jean Xu, and Patricia Martins, that helped me a lot with this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you very much. Beautiful case and also very, very good explanation on the differential uh, diagnosis of it. And I especially like this last photo you put in your presentation. Beautiful place. I want to tell everyone that this is in Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Beautiful country. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, moving on to the next talk. It's my pleasure to introduce Heba Almuteri. She is uh, currently working as an assistant professor of radiology at King Abdulaziz University Hospital in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's also where she went to school. She did her residency training at Leahy Medical, uh, Medical Center in Boston and her MSK radiology fellowship here at MD Anderson Cancer Center. She also practiced for a couple of years at Western Virginia University as an assistant professor of radiology. She currently practices as an MSK radiologist with a focus on bone and soft tissue tumors 
She, since joining Kib King Abdulaziz Hospital, she's been working on expanding the sarcoma multidisciplinary conferences and developing an MSK radiology fellowship program. Hiba, it's uh, great to see you remotely. Uh, the screen is yours. Well, thank you, Dr. Amini and Dr. Sufadi for your invitation and uh, kind introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. All right. Uh, we'll start with our first case of a 50-year-old female with a left uh, shoulder pain. And we see a, a frontal uh, shoulder radiograph where it is a uh, complete destruction of the uh, humeral head, uh, the scapula, the glenoid, and the coracoid process. We see a soft tissue haziness uh, centered at the joint. We also see uh, multiple uh, bony debris and fragments. And we note the um, sharp uh, edges at the proximal humerus for lesion. And we have a CT scan. We see multiple well corticated uh, bony fragments. We see the sharp edges at the glenoid scapula. We see the soft tissue haziness with multiple debris in it. And we see a sharp edges at the uh, proximal humerus. <clears throat> Uh, T1 weighted images, similar changes of soft or of a hypo intense uh, 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 signal central in the joint and multiple osseous fragments. We don't see any other abnormal bone marrow signal. We don't see any uh, additional uh, findings here. And we see the well corticated uh, uh, or the uh, sharp edges. Post contrast images, T1 uh, fat sat with a peripheral enhancement. Uh, but no central enhancement, no soft tissue, and no uh, bony enhancement. Uh, so what's the most likely diagnosis? A lot of residents are asking for this format of multiple choice questions. So that's what I've been doing lately. Um, so we think of chondrosarcoma. What goes against it is the mass is centered within, is not centered within the uh, joint as we see here. Um, this doesn't appear so aggressive because of the sharp and narrow zone of transition, some metastasis, septic joint, uh, and then we think it's a neuropath, what do we think it is, and what would you do next, uh, would you check the hemoglobin, MRC spine, chest radiograph from metastasis, would you tap the shoulder, and um, in this case, uh, it's a neuropathic osteoarthropathy of the shoulder. And uh, classically, you have the five Ds where we look at the bone density, which is normal, unless there's an underlying condition. We have distension, distension of the joint and bony debris, cartilage destruction, joint disorganization, whether it's location or deformity. And the location is, is uh, strongly suggestive of etiology. So you can have a neuropathic arthropathy depending on the location will have a different etiology. And what we are used to seeing is the ankle and midfoot where we have diabetes, those are most frequently encountered. Uh, if you have a syrinx, uh, you can have a shoulder uh, arthropathy. If you have a myomeningeal seal, it would be in the lower extremities, uh, knee. And about 20% of patients who have syringomelia have uh, developed chalk joints. You can have alcohol, which is less common. It can involve the hip and serial injections in the knee, syphilis, and congenital insensitivity to uh, pain. Uh, morphology, you can have a more hypertrophic uh, um, bone, which is about 20% of the cases. Atrophic is about 40% of the cases we see in diabetic patients in the ankle and foot, um, or combined both types with about 40% of the cases as well. So what would you do next uh, in this patient? Um, you're probably gonna, it's, so I think it's reasonable to do a tap. Uh, MRI cervical spine is what was done next, and this is the sagittal uh, T2 uh, images of cervical spine, and we see the T2 hyperintense uh, syrinx in the middle of cervical uh, spinal cord. So the, the teaching points differentiate this from uh, chondrosarcoma. How would you differentiate the two? Um, and uh, we see here uh, uh, x-ray frontal and uh, Lateral radiograph with scapula, and we see uh, what is a soft tissue mass with a rings and arcs of the chondroid matrix. Um, we have also a CT scan of this case. So this soft, this mass arising from the scapula with a large uh, soft tissue components and rings and arcs 
of the matrix, uh, which is classic uh, condor sarcoma. Another companion case is what we see every day with our 54-year-old uh, female who experienced left uh, foot pain and swelling suddenly over the weekend. And we see uh, distension of the joint, multiple osseous fragments, uh, and uh, disorganization of the joints, uh, lucency, and uh, increased density. This is a T1-weighted image. It would be difficult to uh, exclude and uh, superimposed uh, osteomyelitis with this dark T1 signal. And then the post-contrast images would be helpful. Now the distension and the, and the bony debris can distend beyond the joint, uh, as we can see here, it's going upward. And the second case I have is a 13-year-old male who presented to the emergency department after a sport injury and was complaining of pain. And uh, there's no fracture, nothing acute, but we see this uh, 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 loosened uh, tubular shaped lesion uh, in the uh, mid diaphysis of the radius and uh, a little bit of intramedullary and cortical involvement. Um, and this is a magnified image of it in a, a frontal radiograph, stipulated appearance and lucencies. So the patient did get a follow-up MRI. Um, this is a post-contrast images. We see a bit of enhancement, and then the T1 is intermediate signal with uh, um, dots of hyperintense signal, similar things we see on T2 with dotted hyperintense signal and a fat signal within this lesion. So a differential diagnosis for it was, is this a hemangioma? Could it be um, EG, epithelioid hemangioma? Those are usually present with pain. This patient was asymptomatic in terms of lo localized pain. And uh, due to the small size and benign features, they decided to follow up on this patient. Uh, but we thought it was more uh, in line with uh, hemangioma. And hemangiomas are about 1% of all bone tumors. They're more um, dominant female, seen in the spine and the skull that you see frequently. Um, but hemangioma in the long tubular bones are rare. Um, then there's a little bit of uh, literature review that I did just to see if there are any uh, radiological guide to help us. The top two um, articles are more recent than the last couple of years. And they have a small number of patients, about less than 10 each. Um, and then the one at the bottom uh, is uh, is a little bit older, but they went through and reviewed about 75 cases uh, and five cases of their own, um, and the um, to see what uh, findings they can find. And and the more, the takeaway from it is that most common is medullary uh, uh, hemang uh, hemangioma is the most common location, about 50% of the cases, and then periosteal and intracortical are, are less common. Um, they are rare. Uh, we don't see them often. Uh, their radiological appearance varies uh, a lot, and that could be a challenging uh, task for us as radiologists. Uh, the top last, uh, those two studies, none of the, them made the diagnosis pre, um, preoperatively. And then the typical uh, radiological classic uh, presentation include the coarse trabecular bone pattern or soap bubble appearance. And the uh, treatment for those were curtage or excisional biopsies, and they didn't report any recurrence on them. And uh, for treatment, they say a small benign lesion that can be diagnosed and followed up uh, closely with the imaging. For a larger, more expansile, complex uh, lesion, you need further imaging, and you would need to uh, biopsy those and further uh, and follow them closely. Most of the cases were also um, presented with pain. Our case did not have any pain, so that was a bit different. Um, so that's our second case. Our third case is a more straightforward 35-year-old male with hip pain. And we see a loosened uh, lesion in the femoral head. Some of the margins are sclerotic, some a little bit defined, but you can see sclerotic rim around them. And this is the lesion over here. Uh, the patient did present with pain, so a loosened physial lesion and some of his 35 uh, Things you want to think about is, is one of them is clear cell uh, condor sarcoma, which this was excised and proven to be a clear cell uh, condor sarcoma. 
And um, they are a subtype of chondrocytic sarcoma, about uh, 2% of all chondrocytic sarcomas. They're typically low grade, and uh, they get their name from presence of clear uh, chondrocytes, which contain abundance of uh, vocculated cytoplasm due to the uh, presence of glycogen in them. And typically, third to fourth decade, uh, male more than female, and uh, about 20% of the cases would have calcification. And then the predominantly lytic and expansile. But I think the location is always key and that it's located in the epiphysis of the uh, bone. Those are the cases I have for today. Thank you, Haba. Very nice cases. Thank you. Thank you, Haba. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Julio Brandão. Julio is an assistant professor of radiology at the Federal University of Sao Paulo, um, Brazil. He completed his post postdoctoral fellowship in musculoskeletal and quantitative imaging in the Department of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging at the University of California, San Francisco, where he currently is an associate researcher. He's an active member of the Radiology Society of North America and the International Skeletal Society. He has authored and co-authored over 30 peer-reviewed articles and his specific areas of research interest include hereditary and inflammatory myopathies and pediatric musculoskeletal oncology. Please, Julio, take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the kind presentation. So I'm gonna share my, my case. Can you see my, my screen? Yeah. So this is a, a case that we have a few months ago. It's about a 30 years old female presenting with lower back pain, fever, night sweats, and weight loss in the last two months. She did not present any previous medical history. And in the medical examination, she presented with mild pain on palpation of spinous process and lumbar parvertebral musculature. And in the laboratory test, she had C reactive protein elevated. This was the main laboratory abnormality. Here we identified uh, the first uh, uh, X-ray where we could not identify any significant bony abnormalities or soft tissue abnormalities. We just identified this scoliosis uh, to the left side. She progress the radiological studies with a CT. Here we have the bony CT and soft tissue where we could not identify any significant bony lesions in the um, lumbar spine and either a, re a significant soft tissue abnormality as well. When we look to the iliac region, we identify this small lesion in the right iliac that have this thin sclerotic allo, but we could not identify any cortical disruption or a soft tissue uh, mass. She proceeded the investigation with a CT and in, in the uh, CT um, spine uh, MRI, sorry, we identified this diffuse bony abnormality at L4 presented with diffuse low signal on T1, high signal on T2. It this specific uh, geographic peripheral enhancement in post contrast imaging. When we look to the axial imaging here in T2 and post gadolinium, we identify that have a, a small amount of soft tissue mass inside the spinal canal. And here we can identify as well the previous lesion that we identified on CT on the uh, right iliac bone. 
presented with low signal on T1, this periphery and geographic line in T2, and periphery enhancement in the post contrast imaging. Because of the low signal on T1 and that small amount of soft tissue inside the spinal canal, we decided to biopsy the L4 vertebral body. And the result of the biopsy come with bone marrow necrosis. We tried to relate this bone marrow necrosis to any previous pathology of this patient. We could not identify any significant uh, association in her medical uh, results. And we hypothesized that this could be related to any uh, atypical infection, like in some types of tuberculosis, or this could be related to any uh, nail plasma. And we proceed the investigation with a thoracic and abdominal uh, CT studies. And the most uh, important finding was the diffuse hippo vascular masses in the both uh, kidneys. These lesions were biopsy and the results come as a diffuse large B cell uh, uh, lymphoma. After uh, the diagnosis, the patient started the, start the chemotherapy and the planning to do the bone marrow transplantation, but the disease was extremely aggressive. She progressed extremely fast, even during the treatment. And here showing two months after the prior MRI, this diffuse bony and soft tissue lesions. And we start to see a lot of this necrotic pattern lesions uh, all over uh, the body. When we look to the spine of these patients, we see diffuse imaging, pretty similar from the ones that we previously identified just in L4. So with this necrotic diffusely pattern in almost all uh, vertebral, vertebral bodies. The purpose of this presentation was to discuss a little bit about bone marrow necrosis because the, this is a clinical pathological entity that is completely distinct from avascular necrosis and osteonecrosis. This is important uh, to understand that bone marrow necrosis tend to be more extensive and usually compromise the vertebral body, different from avascular necrosis that tend to be more focal and periarticular and rarely on the vertebral body. It's, the bone marrow necrosis is related to the necrosis of the myeloid tissue, different from avascular necrosis that's really related to involvement of the trabecular bone. We know that bone marrow necrosis do not tend to progress to vertebral body collapse, different from avascular necrosis. And the most important point is that finding of bone marrow necrosis could be associated with malignancy. So bone marrow necrosis could be associated with malignancy, usually hematologic. It's important to highlight that this can occur before of the, uh, the diagnosis of malignancy or at recurrence. Because of bone marrow necrosis can occur before the diagnosis of malignancy, an extensive search for malignant disease is justified whenever a bone marrow necrosis diagnosis is identified in this election. Also, we find some case report associating bone marrow necrosis with some cases of sick cell disease and infection, but always when we identify this finding, we have to exclude uh, malignancy, especially hematologic disease. The imaging of bone marrow necrosis present as a central area of variable signal intensity surrounded by a distinct peripheral enhancement ring. Remember that these bone marrow necrosis tend to be diffuse, extensive, um, really distributed in the vertebral bodies and um, the pelvic bones. And we have that geographic uh, after contrast uh, enhancement. Here is just showing another case. This is a 66 years old ma man with no previous uh, disease, presented with diffuse uh, spine pain. When we do the MRI, the, the, the findings are quite similar, but much more diffuse from our previous case. We identified this signal abnormality with low signal on T1. We identify this geographic hyper uh, in intensity on uh, T2 and this peripheral ring of enhancement on, on, on post-contrast imaging. The biopsy show bone marrow necrosis 
And after one month, this patient uh, received the diagnosis of a lymphoblastic uh, leukemia. Here, just showing some images from the literature, showing this specific pattern on T2 that present with this geographic with hyper intensity uh, lines here, pretty similar from our, our cases. So the take home message, remember that bone marrow necrosis can present as a geographic appearance surrounded by a distinct peripheral and handsome ring, tend to be more extensive and usually diffuse involve the pelvic and the spinal bone, especially the vertebral bodies. Remember the association with malignancy, especially hematologic disease, and this could occur before or at recurrency of the disease. And an extensive search for malignancy disease is justified whenever bone marrow necrosis is diagnosed, di diagnosed in isolation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julio. Um, there's a question from Eduardo Brown to Dr. Heba. Do you use perfusion MRI to try to differentiate in chondroma from chondrosarcoma? I'll be honest, it's uh, easy to say we're gonna do more imaging, but the uh, truth is uh, it takes a long time and uh, a lot of our orthoonc don't wanna do uh, more complex uh, series. Um, so we haven't used that. And um, I had one orthoonc who'd only do T1 and STIR images. He wouldn't even give contrast. Um, so um, yeah, we can do that. It would, might help, but um, in other cases, if there's pain, if we do a short-term follow-up and there's increase in size, then we'll raise a concern for clear cell cars. That's what we do. Um, but theoretically, it might help, yes. Okay, any more questions from the audience? Iran, do you have any questions? Um, yeah, I, I had a, a question for Dr. Veras. Um, that, that was a beautiful myeloma case. Um, do you guys do whole body MRI or do any diffusion on your, um, on your spine MRIs? The reason I ask is the, um, you know, on the conventional imaging, when you see an appearance like that, we're always confused between extramedullary hematopoiesis, um, you know, versus malignancy. And um, I find that diffusion can help in those cases. I was waiting for this question. <laughs> I'm glad I could Sorry, help. <laughs> yeah, it was one limitation. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. So, at first, uh, we, we did it. We didn't do because it's not so recently. Uh, but uh, there is a discussion if, if it would help um, because uh, for the uh, the International Society of Myeloma, they suggest that with this presentation, extramedullary is much better to, to undergo a PET CT because it's better to see extramedullary uh, disease than MRI. The MRI can lose them. And I don't know if it would free the patient from biopsy. Probably they... they, they I think she's frozen. Uh, you're muted. Brian. Okay, yeah. I thought it was just me that wasn't hearing. Okay. I don't know, maybe something with her connection. Okay. Okay, let's wait a few more seconds. I think we lost her completely now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Virang, in your practice, do you use perfusion MRI to differentiate anchondroma from chondrosarcoma? Um, you know, it, 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 there's papers um, that, that have been published um, saying that you can um, differentiate them. Um, our biggest challenge is, you know, differentiating anchondroma um, from low-grade chondrosarcoma. And for those, unfortunately, the imaging doesn't help that much. Uh, so while we do uh, are starting to do perfusion and we've run into the same issue as Heba with um, the surgeons not 
enjoying the extra sequences. Um, the um, it's it, it's in one one more piece of information um, that we can use, uh, but we we haven't uh, had much experience with it. Okay, thank you. I think she's back. Hi, you're muted, uh, Dr. Veras. <laughs> I can't hear you, Sabrina. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I now using, I can hear you. I was using the internet from the hospital <laughs> in Finland, so I'm using my cell phone. Okay. okay. I don't know uh, what part did you hear. Uh, we didn't do, and I don't know uh, if the, the multi-parametric multi images would change um what happened because it's it would be necessary to do the biopsy anyway and she mm -hmm. had to decompress the spinal cord in a way That's so true. i don't know if it, it would help a lot and it, it's interesting this case because if you see in pet ct there were no uh, hypermetabolism at the epidural space after the surgery we think that he took all the epidural lesion with the surgery, you know. Wow. That's I good. don't know if I got that. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more questions here. I want to thank you again for tuning in today, and I'm looking forward to the next session next month. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.